Welcome to the Blogger Genius Podcast, brought to you by Milo Tree. Here's your host, Jillian Leslie. Hello, and welcome back to the Blogger Genius. If you want to get the cliff notes of every episode, the four major takeaways of this episode and all episodes going forward, head to bloggergenius.com, sign up, and they will come directly to your inbox. On today's show, I have Camille Whiting, and we are talking about how to use analytics to make smart choices, even for people who do not like analytics. I promise this episode is not scary. It actually makes a lot of sense. If you're an entrepreneur and you're thinking to yourself, which way do I go? This is the episode for you because what you're going to do is you're going to learn strategies for how to make smart choices to help your business grow. So without further ado, here is Camille Whiting. Camille, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I am really excited to have you on the show because as we were just talking about before I pressed record, we both come at blogging from two sides, from a creative side and an analytical side. And we were talking about how the analytical side does not have to be scary. Yeah. Absolutely. So I want to dig in, but first, could you share your entrepreneurial journey just briefly, how you got started, what your blog is, and where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So it's funny to be talking about an entrepreneurial journey because I am a business girl. I have an MBA, and I've worked at some top marketing agencies in the world. Um, And I remember somebody saying in business school, like, what are you going to do as an entrepreneur? And I was like, I'm not going to ever be an entrepreneur. Like, I'm, I'm good with working my nine to five and, you know, anyway, and they kind of laughed at me and said, okay, we'll see. Um, and it's really funny now to work full time for myself and have this entrepreneurial journey almost by accident. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm somebody who learned about blogging actually right when it started, I was in my undergrad and I had a professor say this new thing called blogs actually got released last week and it could be a really cool format to have conversations and publish things online. And I mean, this was kind of before Facebook became mainstream too. Um, and so it was interesting to get started with blogs and just get used to them as something that you could just share, you could just share ideas and thoughts. And so I've kind of always had a side blog just to share information. Um, I've done all kinds of different pieces. Um, I've done some fashion blogging, I've done some personal journaling, I've done a little bit of recipes. And then, um, when I got married, my husband and I decided to create Friday. We're in love. Um, okay. Which is your blog and and which is my blog. Yeah. yeah, and my business. And it's it was just kind of a personal thing. I was a big marriage phobe and was like, I don't really believe in happy marriages. I've I'd previously been married. I'd gone through a lot of abuse, a lot of sad background story. If you want a made for TV movie, you're welcome <laughs> to go read some of my about articles on that that I won't get into. But um when I met Jacob, my husband, he was just perfect. He really is the greatest guy. And I feel like I I under exaggerate him online. He's just oh. a wonderful person. And he was like okay, but if we're going to date, I really believe in marriage and I believe in this forever. And what do we need to do to like get you on board again? And so we did some premarital counseling and we were encouraged to go on a date every week, no matter what, even if we didn't have money, even if we didn't think we had time, um, all the things. And so we decided that we would, we would go out every single week, just as this personal project, we would snap a picture, we would start a blog and we would just share, here's where we went and here's what we did. And I never promoted it. It was like super personal, never intended it necessarily to get huge or anything. Um, and so we did this for months and months and then Pinterest came out Mm. and I'd never, I'd shared with like three friends. I even did this, but somehow people were pinning our dates Mm. and traffic was coming. And so I'm kind of an accidental, really lucky, um, entrepreneur that I just kept creating, kept doing it for the passion side of it. And then after a few years, I looked at it and said, there is a good amount of traffic here. And I heard people started making money off these things. How do they do that? Mm. So I went to a conference. I learned a few things at the conference, but I really made connections that taught me how people made some money blogging. And I kind of applied my business background, my business side. It was kind of my side gig that the goal was like, if it'll pay for kind of elaborate fun dates, cool. That's Mm. what I want out of it. Started sharing a little more personal information. People seemed to like it. Started sharing infertility journey. People seemed to really identify with that too. So anyway, it just, long story short, um, it just kept growing. And when I had a baby, I had a... Um, I had my maternity leave and I was kind of bored. 
Mm. So I kept working more and more at it and I watched it grow and it just turned into a full-time job for me that I'm really lucky to call my job today. That's awesome. And on top of this though, you are a digital strategist. So explain that side. Okay. So I do consulting for companies. I think this comes more from that um, working with Fortune 500 company background. But I think a lot of small businesses don't even know what they're doing online. Um, They know they should have a website. Then they're like, how come nobody's coming to me? Where's the marketing piece of this? Or they say things like, I should be on Facebook or I should be on Instagram. People are there. But they haven't really stopped to think through why or what they're doing. Um, I am a really big picture person. And I've been somebody lucky enough to be so to speak in the room where it happens with some of the biggest companies in the world saying what what is our five-year plan what is our seven-year plan how do we I did a lot of pharma and it was like we have Mm -hmm. seven years before a patent wears off what is like year by year strategy and what are we publishing to get there and I think a lot of companies don't stop to think about that are you trying to sell something are you trying to get more traffic are you trying to solve specific problems like what is your end game where are you going and how are the little pieces of what you're doing online getting you there So I get hired sometimes to go in and to come up with content strategy, like you should be blogging so that you can have better SEO, even if you're um, a small business, not identifying necessarily as a blogger. And you may or may not want to be on a social media, right? I've had a, a bankruptcy attorney try to get big on Facebook. And I was like, I just don't think very many people are sharing, like filed for bankruptcy today. Here's my attorney, you know? So I think there's things like that, that companies just haven't thought through what makes the most sense? Where am I going to get the biggest bang for my buck? And what am I doing online with my content to really get there? Okay. Now, given that you've seen that side and you've now also, you have your own business and your own blog, where do you think bloggers and online entrepreneurs are missing the boat when it comes to SEO and content creation? Okay, so I meet a lot of bloggers. I'm kind of a social extrovert blogger, which can be rare, I know. But when I go to conferences and when I meet local people, it's really interesting to talk to people about SEO. I feel like it's become this really hot topic in the last year or two where people are like, I know I should be doing it. Mm -hmm. I, I wanna learn more about it. And then they're in two camps. They're either like, I love SEO, I'm all about SEO, I'm learning as much as I can. Or they're like, I'm terrified, this scares me to death. Um, I'm not a very technical person or I don't want to focus on that piece or it's sucking all the fun out of writing and doing things. I hear both sides of it. Right. And I feel like there's of, a lot of, I'm going to, I'm going to coin this term SEO shame. Yeah. Where people are like what you just said, I know I should be doing it, but I'm not, I don't really know what I'm doing and I don't feel confident. And so I'm just going to kind of close my eyes a little bit and just like sit in my own little SEO shame bubble and just make some content. Yes. Yes, I agree. And so there's, it's kind of like the twofold. And I would argue that I think most people should be somewhere in the middle there. They should really be looking at SEO and going, this is a great opportunity. I'm a wonderful content creator. I have a business for a reason. What can I do to kind of blend this thinking this is all technical, all something that's going to be hard to understand versus creating content? And so I, I really think people should care more about it, but also know that it can be super approachable. Um, my theory on SEO too is that content is king. We hear mm. that all the time, but content really is king. And I think we get hung up on SEO being, well, my site speed isn't as quick as other people or because I probably uploaded images wrong eight years ago when yep. I didn't know what I was doing and yep. I've blown everything. And yep. And those things are important. These technical pieces are important, but I really think they're maybe 10 to 20% max of your SEO and your content is going to be that biggest chunk of it. I mean, people aren't going to come to your site to see how fast it is. They're going to come to your site to see what kind of content is there and what it's doing for them. And so I think instead of getting totally hung up on what is every technical piece that I probably don't know that I'm doing or I'm doing wrong, People should reframe it on, I'm a content creator, I know how to create content, and what can I do to make my content better serve my audience? Okay, so let's say today I am listening to this podcast and I say, okay, I want to do it. What do I do? Okay, so let's let's start um, through just some good general practices, because I'm a big like takeaway, go do things like a list type person. Okay. So let me give you a couple of things. Let's talk about content moving forward. If you listen to this today and you're like, whoo, I'm overwhelmed by the past. 
Okay, <laughs> let's start with moving forward. We'll talk about the past too, but let's talk about moving forward and what your content should look like. Most people are not reading your thousand word posts. Yes. I hate to, to crush anyone's soul. I'm a verbose person. My posts are long too. Um, people are skimmers. And so yes. are you writing for people to find what they're looking for in your post? Um, if they're searching for, you know, how to make the best chicken or something like that, um, can they scroll through your post and find exactly the pieces that they think they're missing to make the best chicken? Or do they have to sit and digest your entire post word for word to have any idea what they're doing? Mm -hmm. Um, I think making your posts so that they're really easy to read is the first thing people should look at. Um, I like Yoast, the plugin, mm -hmm. but I have heard so many people say this and I agree with it. Yoast is a robot and you're not yes. writing for a robot. So yes. kind of loosely follow Yoast. But I think when I first got started looking at Yoast and going, my readability score is always an F. Why? Starting to understand that I was writing too long of sentences. I wasn't breaking up paragraphs. I was not making my posts skimmable. Right. That was a good place for me to get started. Right. To go, okay, I need to make this easier to read. I need people to find what they're looking for. Um, I had no idea a few years ago about headers. Mm. Headers are something that is, it's a technical piece and an artistic piece. Um, you want to use H2s whenever possible. That tells Google, like, this is, this is um, a header. This is a piece of content people are looking for. The content under that header should answer this piece of information. So, for example, if you are writing that chicken recipe, um, maybe you want to make a header about the ingredients. Maybe you want to make a header about how long to marinate. Maybe you want to make a header about... Um, if you should beat it, flatten it, all the things that go into making chicken, right? And so people can find those headers with those keywords and they can really digest the content that you're writing. Right. So I think Yoast is great for that because it does put up the flags, even though it's a robot, it'll put up the flag saying, Hey, robots can't read what you're saying, so maybe humans can't read this either. Right, and there and, is a few. There's a free, uh, a free version of Yoast. You can just install it on your WordPress, and it will give you kind of a green light, a yellow light, a red light to tell you how well optimized your post is. And I agree with you, which is take everything with a grain of salt. But directionally, I always say to myself, if somebody were reading this post or skimming this post in line at Target. Could they get the gist? Yeah. With a screaming that's... kid. With a screaming kid. Mm -hmm. Like, if, yeah. if you could, like, there's enough space between bullets, you know, it's like broken down really easily. It's like writing for like a fourth grader. And I don't mean that pejoratively. I just mean that somebody could be kind of half distracted and still know how long to marinate that chicken. Yes. That's absolutely. the goal. Absolutely. Okay. Or if they have the, I had a friend say this, I know there's been a lot of joke in the food community and I only do so much food on my site. So once again, take this with a grain of salt, but a lot of people have said like, oh, but they're getting so SEO heavy that like, you're like, just give me the dang recipe. Right. And food bloggers are going, yeah, but I also make a living doing this and you don't have to pay for a cookbook right now. So just scroll and help me too. Right. So there's a blend there. But my, one of my friends, when I told him that I said, well, it's, it's their SEO. So don't get too annoyed. He's like, well, if I'm holding raw chicken in one hand, I just want to figure out what I'm doing next. Yes. So I have now thought of that everything I write. Like if somebody's holding raw chicken in one hand, can they still scroll and yes. figure out what to do with that chicken? For, proverbial speaking, right? But yes. um, with what you're trying to share. And so I think a lot of people, they don't realize that their writing can be the main problem, that it's just too hard to digest yep. and to get what you're looking for. And I think when you start thinking of SEO and you start going, oh, I can do shorter sentences and I can... I can really divide this up. That is like the best place to start to make your post really easy to read and really easy to follow. Yes. Um, a couple other things that I think are so key. I always say whenever I talk about SEO um, to friends, presenting anything, your goal is to be the most useful piece of information on the web. That is yes. your number one goal. Yes. And so sometimes as bloggers, especially someone like me who started this as a journal, you've got to reframe how you're writing. Are you writing this egocentrically? That's who, this Oh my God. I, I was just having that exact same thought. Okay, keep going. So, you know, I, I think through and I'm like, yeah, we share a lot of date ideas in our content. And a few years ago, I had a friend say, do you know what would actually be more helpful is if you broke down like quick at the top of your post, what you did, how much it was, the website, where people can buy tickets, like all those kinds of things. And I was like, that's genius. I've never thought of that because I've always been sharing my story. Not I understand that you guys are coming here to try to find 
date ideas right? and right. fun family activities. So right. what can I do to better serve you? And I'm glad she said that. This, this was before I started digging in deeper with my own personal SEO. Um, but I really was like, what can I do to be more useful to my readers? And I think that's another place a lot of sites should take a step back and go, what, what can I do with my content to be more useful? How can I be the most useful piece of content on the web regarding this subject matter? And I think there's a life lesson in there too, which is it's less about me and more about how I can be of service. Yep, absolutely. So taking some of that ego and that vanity out of it and saying, what am I giving other people here? How do I make this more user-friendly? Um, I'm big on user experience. I used to sit in these boardrooms where it would take us a year to put up a new website and it would be like a million dollar website with top people in the world creating the website, right? All the pieces of the website. But we really stopped and looked at every single piece of the website and saying, how is it serving? What is it doing? What is the strategy behind this? And I think it's really important to get very real about that with your content and with your website too, and say, what is the user experience here? Yep. What are people coming for? How yep. do they get there? How do my menus lead to that? So we used to say in the digital world, if people, if it took more than two to three clicks to get a piece of information they were looking for, we had failed them. Ooh. So they need to get there. And, and that was, you know, working on a pharma side, it was like, okay, if you're a doctor, how do you get the drug information you're looking for quickly on the site? Well, that's not exactly what I think any bloggers are really writing about. Um, but when I think of it, if people have come and they know we shared a recipe as a date, how do they quickly funnel into the content in two to three clicks to get what they remember from my site. Mm. And so that is something to think about as you design navigation, as you design posts, as you interlink within a post you're writing, right? Don't assume that your readers have read every single thing, especially when it comes to SEO, right? They're searching, they're finding you, and this is very likely their first interaction with your site. So you want to make sure it's just so easy serving them, getting exactly where they want to be in two to three clicks. Hey, are you a blogger or entrepreneur who loves their business, but is a little overwhelmed with all that you have to do in a day? Well, you are not alone. We all feel this way. So I want to share a pop-up tool that will increase your social media followers, grow your email list, build your traffic, and it is called MiloTree. MiloTree is a pop-up app that my husband, David, built for our first site, Catch My Party. In the four years that we've been using the MiloTree pop-up on Catch My Party, our Pinterest account has grown exponentially to over 1.1 million followers. And our Instagram has grown to over 160,000 followers. And these social networks now drive millions of page views to our site every single month. MiloTree works to grow followers on Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. It'll grow your sales on Shopify or Etsy, and it will even grow your email list. You can focus on growing one platform at a time or switch between several. The choice is yours. MiloTree. It's easy to install. You can do it in under three minutes. It's completely optimized. Right now, you can get your first 30 days for free. Just go to MiloTree.com to sign up for your free trial. If you are not converting your site visitors into followers, subscribers, and customers, you need to change your strategy. To take the first step, head over to MiloTree.com and start your free trial. There's no risk. And you'll be joining thousands of other professional bloggers who are already using MiloTree to grow their businesses. As a bonus, once you sign up, I'll send you valuable business tips each week to help you continue to accelerate your growth. You can't be everywhere all the time, so let MiloTree work for you. It's fast, it's easy, and it gets results. So what are you waiting for? Head to MiloTree.com and start your free trial. Are there any other things that you would say as an overall strategy? So serve your audience, don't serve yourself. This isn't a vanity blog. It used to be. No, it's no longer. Um, and, and by the way, there, I also would say that's true about photos. You know, we are, yeah. if we're food bloggers, we take all these beautiful photos and we want to put them all in the post because we can't like, you know, they're also beautiful. And the truth is, do all these photos serve your audience? Probably not. 
Maybe no, the marinating the chicken and showing what that looks like serves your audience. But at the end of the day, how many how many photos do they need of this beautiful completed chicken? Probably one. Maybe a, a you know maybe you cutting into it, and that's yeah. it. So be be very mindful of are you putting this photo in for yourself or are you putting this photo in to serve your audience? Absolutely. I mean, I can say that I do some fashion blogging too. And I think not as many fashion bloggers do as much SEO just by nature of it's kind of, you know, a quick turnaround and what you're selling and showing. But when I think through that, every time I put up a fashion post, I'm like, people only need to see like maybe the front of the dress, the side of the dress, a close detail. And that's good. Even if I did a billion glamour shots and I love them, that's, that's totally exactly whatever genre you're in. You should stop and think about, are my images serving my audience or are they just weighing down my site? And then I think also thinking about user experience, I'm going to go back to that one with your content. Most people are on mobile these days. A few years ago, I remember looking at it and going, okay, 70% of my traffic is desktop and 30 is mobile. For me, that's now flipped. And I think for most people, you're going to continue mobile traffic. And think through your images and go, what what is best? Sometimes that's actually a horizontal picture. I know a lot of us think in Pinterest terms. A lot of times it's easier to see the horizontal with the text. Sometimes it's it's not. The horizontal looks terrible in that little screen, right? So think through that experience on both places and how your content will be served up for both audiences. And that is a really easy way to start with your SEO. Um, I think another one, the biggest one that I'm kind of missing is keywords, Ooh, right? Yes. We think of yes. it as I should be searching. I should be, I should be putting a keyword in. You should be putting multiple keywords in. You should be looking for three to five keywords in every post and really optimizing for those keywords. So put them in your headers, um, put them very logically in what you're writing. Um, don't write for bots, write for people, yep. but also put in keywords. So no keyword stuffing. That's like a bad practice from a decade ago, um, but put them in naturally so people can find them. Use synonyms and and also do some research. Look up programs and find the best keywords. You'll be amazed at how, you know, we, we all use a specific nomenclature for the industries we're in or what we do. I, I could say jargon too, right? You have jargon for where you are. It was amazing to me to go to college and have a roommate from um, South Carolina and learn how many words we used differently. Mm. Um, very enlightening. And so I think looking it up and going, oh, well, geez, a lot more people search it this way than the way I would say it. And so, um, but also on the inverse, if you're looking it up and you're feeling a little disheartened, like I'll never rank for that term. Chicken recipes is all over the place. Um find those other smaller terms and other ways people use words and go after those. There's right. room for everyone to really grow in SEO. Even if you have the exact same blog as your friend, right. you can both rank for different keywords in a very similar post. And it's kind of a really fun, beautiful thing to blend that creative side of this with some of that technical research of how much people are searching, what words they're looking for. So whenever you write a post, I would stop and think about what you want to write and I would go do some research and find three to five keywords that you can naturally fit in your post several times and I would make sure you include those as you get started with SEO. Now, what about building content off of existing content? Yeah, that is a great strategy. So for example, if you do Instant Pot recipes and you had an Instant Pot soup recipe just really take off. That is a great place to stop and go through and and do some of your own digital strategy and say, what makes the most sense? Should I now be an Instant Pot soup recipe person? Because I have a ton of them and that did great. So I'm going to go create more Instant Pot soup recipes. And I'm even going to create a category that is Mm. Instant Pot soup recipes. I'm going to create a category page that is Instant Pot soup recipes. And I'm going to go after some of those keywords and I'm going to use my posts to continue to build that and to to get some more domain authority, um, so to speak, on that. But you also can look at it and go, did I share enough? I shared how to create this instant pot soup. Did I share enough about the ingredients that go into it or how to, I don't know, how to clean my instant pot or um, how soup is different than a casserole? Like, are there more helpful, best piece of content on the web type articles I can write as my content strategy based off this. I love that. So you'd come at Instapot from a variety of different directions. Yeah. And and that's the fun part where I think people think 
SEO is just technical. This is really the artistic side where you get to say that did well. What else do I get to create? How else can I help audiences? And what else can I write? Yes. Yes. And like there are cool ways to think about it. Like you could do a quick start guide to Instapot recipes or, or I like your idea of like how to clean your Instapot or where's the best place to store your Instapot or and then you can be linking to all of these different resources in each post. Yeah, absolutely. And building it out and, and making these landing pages that you can start to go after bigger keywords, right? You might be ranking for like lemongrass Instant Pot Soup, but going after instant pot soup recipes is a lot more search traffic. I can guarantee that. I'm not even researching it right now, but I can guarantee that that is a much bigger keyword with much bigger traffic. And it's often building these little articles that do really well and then making that landing page that links out to them that really gets people with SEO. So so it's a fun strategy to think of like, how do my little pieces of content now start to grow and how do I get a content strategy to go after bigger things that I really want to be. That's cool. Okay, now in terms of Google Analytics, I'm going to say it. It's like a dirty word. Google Analytics. <laughs> Where do you, if I'm if I'm somebody who's scared of my, I put Google Analytics on my site, but it's, and I have to say, I'm a technical person and I still find Google Analytics to be a bear that I can't even get my arms around. Yeah. Where should I go? What are the kind of down and dirty places that I should be looking in my Google Analytics and how often should I be checking them? Okay. I used to be a little bit of one of those people and then we had someone at one of my jobs uh, in my office and his title was literally um, analytics guru. That was his job <laughs> title. And I once was like, hi, um, could we, he asked for a favor for me and I said, could we go to lunch? I am a big believer in hiring people and not just saying, could we go to lunch? But I was like, could we talk about analytics? And it's so funny how, if you have a friend that's even okay with analytics, I would be like, could we sit down and just like, you just show me a couple of things. I do this a lot for people. I'll, you can even hire me. I will do this with you for an hour. And I think, I think once people go into their analytics one time and really look at a couple of reports, they're like, this is cool how did I not do this before? Mm. The other thing is, I think people think they're going to break their analytics. Yes. You can run any report you want. You can click in any way you want. You can try and experiment and make these like custom reports of like, ooh, I'm going to look at my acquisition. So that's one place I would start looking. Acquisition is a tab in there that shows you where your traffic is coming from. Okay, so so wait, I just want to stop for a second. So think about it this way. You are acquiring your audience. That's why it's called acquisition. (laughs) Yeah. And where are they coming from? Right. And, and so it's, don't be afraid of them. Just click around and start to look. And the other cool thing is they've made it so you can like hover over areas and they will explain to you what it is. There's also Google, there's YouTube, there's people that have gone through your analytics um, that you can learn anything you want. And I promise once you master like one report, one way to look at something, the, the floodgates open after that. You're like, oh, well, then what do these other tabs do? I think acquisition is a big, big one, especially as we talk about SEO, looking at where your traffic is coming from and being very real. Are, are people even searching for things? Do you have zero search? Do you have a foundation of some search? Um, what words are getting them there? That also is linked to Google Search Console. So if you don't have that set up, I would get that set up and I would get your analytics and your Search Console linked. But Look at acquisition and start looking at the overviews, start looking at all of your traffic, and you can drill down really specific into really fun things like, oh, people are coming from Pinterest, which is also a search engine and also a form of SEO, I'd argue. Um, but you can start going, what pins are doing well? Right. What, are, what are people really looking for? Right. Um, if I'm looking at search, what percentage is search? What can I do from here? Um, so acquisition is a great one. And then I personally like looking at the behavior hat tab, sorry, the behavior tab quite a bit too, which is just on the left. These are like top level things. Don't yep. panic anyone that's never seen this before. Um, and start looking what people are actually interacting with on your site. Are they sticking around? Are they clicking off certain posts? Are they going from post to post? Um, this will help you better understand a lot of your actual content on your site. There's even a tab within it called site content and you can look at how pages are doing. You can look at content drill downs. You can search from there, content drill down. I'm going to search chicken and see how many hits you're getting in a time frame on chicken posts. And that's another stre- strategic thing you can do to go, oh, wow, people really do well with my chicken posts. I'm going to keep writing chicken 
recipes. Right. And Um, again, it also gives you insight into putting those internal links so that somebody is clicking on your chicken recipe and then there's a link to how do I, how do you clean a a chicken and that they're clicking over to that because the goal is to get them in and then have them stay because they're learning. Yes, absolutely. And, and I have found in personal experience when you do a couple posts that serve them, you often get them as a long-term reader. They'll mm-hmm. opt into your email list or they'll start bookmarking. You know, it's a beautiful thing to get that search traffic and then try to keep them long-term as readers and followers. Okay, so Google Analytics, definitely check it out. Play around. I love the idea that you cannot break it. So, yeah. so you so, can't break it. Make a make a report. Go in and add. Play at the top. It has like um, exactly what it is. Add segment at the top of anything. Try it. Click it. Make custom reports that pull. I mean, you can get so nitty gritty about. I'm only pulling search traffic on these days that are coming for chicken recipes, and then you can you know make a custom report and look up that same thing every week and see how it's going for you. But that's something that you got to play around with and you got to kind of test it. And you know what? If it doesn't work, you can delete the customer. products are not broken. You can still find all of the data. It's really easy to do once you've just kind of got in, not had a panic attack and, <laughs> and done some of it. So. And if you need help, reach out to Camille because she will help you. Like, yeah, I, I love it. I'm, I'm giddy about this. I know that you said most people get terrified of this. Right. I have to set like timers on how long I get to be on Google Analytics. And it's like my reward. If you get two posts scheduled, you have 20 minutes to play around in analytics. I know I'm weird, but I love it. I really love it because the data doesn't lie. Right. And there's so much you can infer from the analytics that can help you make better business decisions and better content strategy decisions. And it's, it's really fun for me. So if it's not for you, let's hang out. Sometime. I love that. I love that. Okay. Now, when you were starting out, uh, like, what is the one thing you wish you knew then that you know now that you would have, you know, that would have helped saved you hours or helped move your business forward faster, that kind of thing? What would you say? I think you can hire things out. Mm. I did everything. I bootstrapped everything. I'm kind of proud of that fact that it really was like, very little investment, but at the same time, I think I would have grown so much faster if I would have hired some experts to do some things that I didn't know how to do. Mm. Um, like for example, I've, I've done a lot of do it yourself, set up your website. Mm. And there was one point where I was like, I'm making enough money. Why am I not hiring someone to do all of this for me in a redesign? And I, I did, I hired an expert. It was smooth. It was prettier. It was faster. It was all the things. And I think when you look at those weaknesses that you know you have and and your gut's just telling you, you know, if I just had someone actually, you know, taking care of my Pinterest or I just had someone um, designing this for me or I just had a coach come in and tell me how to get a better system, invest in those things. I think mm-hmm. if I would have done those with mentors earlier on, I would have been a lot more successful. Wow. Okay. And what is the one tool that you use? in your online business that you couldn't live without? There are a lot. So I kind of have to give two. Automation softwares are one. Okay. Um, like? You got to buy time. Like Tailwind, yeah. um, Instagram app scheduling. Um, I, I even use Google Calendar, I would I would argue, is an yeah. automation software that tells you how and when to. And then on the SEO side, SEM Rush is my favorite. Mm. It is pricey and it is worth it. If you're really going to dig into SEO, it is a tool I absolutely hope you need. We use it too. We do. I, 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 I decided to pay for a couple months. I think it's about a hundred bucks a month. I actually yeah. share it with somebody. I don't know if you're allowed to do that. I don't know if SEO Rush is coming, going to come after me. Uh, <laughs> so we each pay 50 bucks a month. And um, I find it at first, I was like, I'm just going to have it for a couple months and then I'll cancel it. Uh, and then once I started to dig in and really see, not only can you see your own keywords and stuff, but you can even see your competitors. It's just a really rich tool. I couldn't get rid of it. So I found somebody to split it with me. So if you're thinking about it, that might be a strategy. It, it is a good way to go. I have a little more information on this also on my site on Friday. We're in love.com backslash analytics. I go through a couple tools that I like for okay. keywords and NSEM rush is my favorite. You can split it. I would caution you if you're going to split it, do it with someone you absolutely trust because this is 
your business strategy in the background and, and you just want to make sure it's someone that you would be okay if they ever clicked over and saw some of it. Um, but you absolutely, it's fine to share it. I, I was the same. I know how to get a lot of that information other places, but my husband was the one that was like, why are you spending an hour doing that research when you can just pay a hundred a month and get it in a minute or two? And I was like, well, all right, I will try it. And I'm like married to, I mean, I'm married to my husband. My husband's <laughs> my love most, but SEM Rush is not far behind. I really love it. It's a tool. I, I couldn't do the content I produce now without it. Absolutely. And it, we'll link to it in the show notes if anybody wants to check it out. I think you get a month free or do you get some sort of yeah, trial you, period? Sometimes like 14 it's a week. Days? And, okay. Sometimes something. it's a week. Sometimes it's a month. Um, but so find a time when you're like, I can commit a week yep. if it's only a week. Yep. And then try it. That's what I would. I would say. And where, okay, and in your business, what are you most excited about right now? I'm excited that summer's coming. I know for a lot of people, <laughs> it's like the slump time and they maybe don't even work as much. But for me, it's a time I work a lot. I'm a mom with a toddler and a nine month old right now. And it's a time where I have more babysitters, childcare. And I think strategically, just because this is my brain and what I do, um, this is when I really put my, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess I just put to practice the things I want to do. The mm. dreams in my head, mm. I finally find the time to create um, I some products, some things that I've been wanting to do for a long time. So I am really excited that summer is coming and it's like my content powerhouse time so that when the busy like holiday seasons come um, where I'm working more with sponsors and other things, um, my other content and everything else is in a row. I like that. I find I find that too, which is summer is my time to go deeper on stuff because I'm less distracted, even with email. I like that everybody's on vacation because I'm kind of sometimes I am on vacation in the summer, but sometimes I'm just working my tail off and I can get a lot done. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Camille, how can people one get some date ideas, dating ideas. I uh, and two, how can they reach out to you to learn more and pick your brain about all this cool strategy that you talk about? Okay, so Friday we're in love.com website. Every Friday we post date ideas. Um, a lot of Mondays we post lists of categories. So I have my site really organized so you can drill down to any type of date you want, free, um, active. It, it's very categorized. So. Go check out there. I also have an email opt-in right on there. Um, and I promise it's a good one. Every week I send out a date idea mm. or a date list to mm. people. So you can get on the list. And I feel like I'm very much serving the need for date ideas through email right now. Um, and then Instagram I'm really active on. Friday we're in love. Um, there I'll share date ideas. And then some of our other lifestyle content, parenting as well. Um, you can reach out to me if you want to do more consulting. Come to me at Camille at Friday We're in love dot com. Okay, spell uh, your name. C A M I L L E. And then it's just at Friday We're in love dot com. And what? you can also find that really easy on the website. Too. Okay, one last question. If you are feeling disconnected from your spouse, what kind of date do you recommend to bring you back together? Do one that you can talk a lot at, but it still has a fun activity. So I, am not even the biggest sports person, but I think like a baseball game is a good example for that. You both can have fun and kind of watch, but you can talk quite a bit through it as well. Um, I think there are all kinds of courses and things you can take online that you might want to do at home and look at that open up conversations and help you feel more connected. And then I also think sometimes you just need to laugh if you feel a little bit like, um, not as connected. So find a comedy club or find a touring comedian and go do something hilarious. So you Mm. start on like a really happy foot and then go get dinner, go get ice cream, go get a drink, whatever after and really spend some time talking while you're in that great mood. That seems to really connect to people every time. Oh, this is great. This is great. Awesome. All right. I'm going to go do that. I mean, I'm, 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 I typically feel connected to my husband. We work together. So sometimes having to turn that off can be difficult. But I do find laughter is like the best way to bond. It really is. And, and it breaks the ice and it gets you back into it. And if you're out of the habit of dating, I have some posts on this too about getting back to it, um, getting back in the groove, setting your own like weekly or biweekly date goals. I mean, we're really passionate about it. And I really feel strongly that this has made our marriage awesome. We're eight and a half years in and 
everything we plan to do when we were engaged, I feel like has come true because we do really fun, really cool things every week. It's just been awesome. Awesome. Camille, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. And remember, if you want to start immediately growing your social media followers and your email list, you want to do it effortlessly, go right now, act now, head to milotree.com, sign up for your first 30 days free, try it out, email me, let me know how it's going, and you will join an exclusive group of professional bloggers who are already using it to grow their businesses. Okay, I will see you here again next week. Mm-hmm.